Friends, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Life's a journey, not a destination. We've probably all heard that phrase at one time or another. The band Aerosmith used it in a song in the 1990s called Amazing. Steven Tyler, the lead singer, wrote, Life's a journey, not a destination, and I can't tell what tomorrow brings. Lots of theories on where this phrase came from originally. The most likely source seems to be a pastor named Lynn Huff, who used it when he was doing a Sunday school teaching back in the 1920s about the Apostle Peter. Regardless of who came up with the phrase and when, this is the phrase that kept coming up to me as I looked over our readings this week. <coughs> We've been slowly recovering from a major hurricane and praying for others as yet another one slammed into Florida this past week. Lights are on again, and then off again, and then on again. Our nerves have been given a jolt every time some bad actor or conspiracy theorist decides to go on the internet and peddle lies about new storms and raise doubts about the helpers sent to assist with the <coughs> real ones. As linemen and women work to untangle power lines from down trees and broken power poles that snap like toothpicks, thousands, even millions of people are sweaty, hot, tired, and bothered. We humans are not always the best at being patient, especially when we're uncomfortable. The journey lately has certainly been rocky and fraught with difficulty. Like Job and our psalmist, we lament we want a quick fix, and we want it now. My God, my God, when are we going to get the air conditioning? <laughs> Haven't we been good people? What else must we do to get the power on and stay on? That's where we find our rich man coming to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. He wants to know, good teacher, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. Isn't there something else that I can do? We can almost picture Jesus raising an eyebrow at this question. What must he do? Jesus takes this in and goes ahead and tells the man to basically keep the commandments that he presumably already knows. But that's not really what the rich man is after. He wants to know, what's the quickest way to get to the destination? To get, to get and possess this thing called eternal life. He's impatient. He already knows all about the journey. The whole, don't murder, don't bear false witness, yada, 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 okay? Um, he wants to know, what else must he do? Again, I'm thinking that Jesus' eyebrows must be permanently up at his forehead. This rich man has completely <laughs> misunderstood the mission. Because none of this is about <coughs> doing. It's about being. It's how one is living right now to make things better in the world right now. It's about the journey, being in communion with all of creation, the expansion of friends and family. It's about that sense of belonging that manifests both when life is going great and learning how to make lemonade when we're given a bushel of lemons. I think we can all get caught up in this same misconception that we must do 
something to receive what is already given to us freely in the form of God's grace. We tend to think that grace is some sort of commodity that if we can only have, if we do something more, something extra, beyond simply being and living a life based on love. But the thing is, we can't do anything to earn a gift that is already freely given. And there's no shortcut or get grace quick fix. What Jesus offers to this man, what is offered to us, is the invitation to stay on the journey and not worry so much about the destination. And that requires us to change our perspective of what it means to inherit eternal life. Eternal life is the present, not some future when I get to heaven sort of a thing. How are we moving, living, having our being right now as people of God? Like the disciples and this rich man, we can so easily get deluded into thinking that grace equals material rewards. Let's see, that's that terrible theology of the prosperity gospel. That somehow having lots of money and things is proof that God loves us. But the reward that Jesus is promising has nothing to do with money or more stuff. And that's the rub for the rich man. Jesus has burst his belief bubble and challenged a whole system of believing that equated wealth and status with living in God's favor. It's what Job has gotten wrong in his ranting and raving at God in our first lesson. Job like the rich men, like Peter, and like us, mistake that having material things signals God's favor. But a life of faith is not a guarantee of only good things in life. In fact, to follow Jesus is to join with him at the bedside of a sick relative, in the grief of a spouse, with the person who has lost a home or their job, to cry out in those words, we remember Jesus saying from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, it's too bad that we don't hear all of Psalm 22, because the psalmist knows that even in the moments of agony, that God is still there. Later in Psalm 22, at verse 23, we hear... For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry out to him, he hears them. Because God shows up for us and in us. God becomes known and seen and experienced when we help each other. When we come alongside a person, whether it's a family member, friend, or stranger, and lend an ear, or place our hand on their shoulder, that is the way, the truth, the life of being Jesus. That sort of loving kindness is a manifestation of God's love in the here and now. Companionship, compassion are the riches that we get on this journey. Journeying together through the valley of the shadow of death makes that trek a whole lot less lonely and frightening. Being willing to let someone be the embodiment of Jesus for us makes us a whole lot more human. In the name of our one divided and holy trinity. Amen.